is going on everybody? Welcome back to Jelly Goon TV. Welcome back to all you beautiful people on YouTube. Thank you so much for turning in and thank you so much to my subscribers for being here. And thank you so much for the new viewers, of course. Today we have another common request, but before I get to that, I want to, you know, recommend my rap channel right here, Anxious Rap TV. I have two songs out, Beautiful and Fake Rapper. So go over and check them out if you want to hear some rap. So uh, yeah, without further ado, we have another common request right here. And he says, we act to Napoleon Young. 1813, The Road to Lipsick. So, uh, yeah, this is 26 minutes long. So, that's what we're going to do. We're going to react to this one. Guys, business email right here if you want to, you know, your brand, you want to do something or just want to write to me. So, yeah, without further ado, let's just get into this one and see what it's all about. Twitter is always all down here so you can contact me. So, yeah, let's go. Who carry a noble and have... Uh, Basis rune, having gotten such glory, we could betray peace in Europe, but we has done the spells is broken. Aha! Uh -huh. He gone, man, he gone. 1812 had been a disastrous year for Napoleon. Uh oh. He the got invasion fucked up of in Russia, Russia right? led to the almost total destruction of an army of half a million men. Let me pause here. If you want to react to the reason in the Russia where Napoleon took Russia and basically just got exterminated. Please check that reaction out if you want to. It's, it's way back, I think. So, uh, yeah, we reacted to that. So, uh, let's get into it. It was crazy, though. Now, Poland and Germany were wide open to Russian attack. Uh oh. Some advised Emperor Alexander that this was the time to make a favorable peace with Napoleon. Russia's own armies had been mauled, and Western Russia devastated. But Alexander was determined to see Napoleon defeated for good. Wow. To free Europe from his clutches. That's crazy. And avenge Moscow's destruction by taking Paris. Oh, wow. Napoleon's allies were deserting him. Prussian troops had already agreed a truce with the Russians. Schwarzenberg's corps marched back to Austria, which assumed a policy of watchful neutrality. Napoleon had left Marshal Murat in charge of the remnants of the army. But he left for the Kingdom of Naples, Ooh. hoping to cut a deal with the Allies that let, would let him keep his throne. Let me pause here, man. Everybody is just dissolving right now. That's what Napoleon sees, that all his allies is going away because they don't want to die. They see the defeat in him. People, they only want to be with you when they succeed. But when they're defeated, you, you have no friends, you have no allies because people is not going to, you know, subscribe to that ideology of defeat. So, yeah, that's crazy, man. Napoleon is basically defeated, man. Let's get into it. He was replaced by Napoleon's stepson, Eugène, who'd proved himself a brave and able soldier in Russia, but was unused to independent command, and wow. now faced odds of four to one. As Russian forces advanced through Poland, he continued to retreat west, leaving garrisons to hold strategic fortresses, most of which were soon besieged. Wow. On the 7th of February, Russian troops entered Warsaw unopposed. Napoleon's Polish client state, the Duchy of Warsaw, effectively ceased to exist. Three weeks later, Russian troops entered Berlin, while Sweden joined the Allies. Sweden, what are you doing, my brother? Sweden was ruled by Napoleon's former Marshal Bernadotte now officially known as Crown Prince Karl Johann. Many would accuse him of betraying Napoleon, but he'd always been clear that once he became Sweden's Crown Prince, he'd pursue Swedish interests, which is what he now claimed to do. In exchange for Norway, to be taken from France's ally, Denmark, and one million pounds from Britain, Bernadotte agreed to join what was now the sixth coalition against France since the revolution with an army of 30,000 troops. Ten days later, King Frederick William of Prussia declared war on France. It followed weeks of indecision. The king was widely seen as a weak character and terrified of Napoleon. But with guarantees of Russian military support, the return of lost territory, and enormous financial and material aid from Britain, he agreed to field an army of 80,000 men. Let me pause here, man. He has no respect for his own country. He's only a war 
king when it comes to that he has the allies because he's basically scared of Napoleon. What a pussy. That's how it is with many countries. They just back some big countries up and then they go to fight, right? You can't really fight for your own country because you got to get supported by everybody else. But this king is very scared of Napoleon. But now that Napoleon is under defeat, of course, he want to ride in and just scoop their victory, right? He want to be the king, the king of the people. He want to take the easy way out where everybody they does the job and Napoleon is almost defeated. And now he want to go on and just kill everybody, right? That's the crazy part. But uh, yeah, I understand. I understand you want to be like that. But uh, let's get into it. Let's go. On the 17th of March, he issued a proclamation to the people of Prussia and Germany. And mein Volk, to my people, summoning them to fight for Prussia and Germany's honour, in what would soon be known as the German War of Liberation. Wow. The Prussian army had been greatly reformed since its humiliating defeat to Napoleon in 1806. A military commission headed by General von Scharnhorst had sacked nearly 200 old generals and abolished flogging, expanded recruitment and introduced exams for officers, wow. and overhauled training, tactics and drill. When Napoleon met the new Prussian army in battle two months later, he remarked, these animals have learned something. Small consolation, they'd learned most of it from Oh him. wow, let me pause here. So Napoleon is basically learning the enemy how to cope with strategic points and strategic movement and education of the people and everything. That's kind of crazy that Napoleon actually showed the enemy how to do and now they got, you know, now, now they got used against him of course, but uh, that's crazy man. Napoleon man, I'm sorry man, but you, you, you fucked up. <laughs> Let's get it. Only a short time ago, I was the conqueror of the world, commanding the largest and finest army of modern times. That's all gone now. Napoleon the Count Maul. Wow, that's crazy. Let me pause here. That's actually amazing to see that he actually said these words because it's so true. Like, you will to get success, but that success will succeed down into the level that you really can control or you will to die. Because, you know, he had so many things. Like, he owned the world. Everybody was, you know, scared of him every time. But now everybody is going against him just to show that, you know what? F you, man. We don't need you in this life. We don't need you on this earth. We don't need you to control us. We can control ourselves. But basically, Russia needs to pull back to their own country because Russia is probably just going to take every single thing that's their plan. They don't care about other countries, but uh, yeah, let's get into it. Let's go. As his enemies massed in Germany, Napoleon was in Paris, working tirelessly to build a new army with which to face them. 137,000 new conscripts joined the army. Wow laws passed to call up 100,000 more, while 40,000 veterans from the army in Spain, 16,000 marines, and 80,000 men of the wow, National Guard, a lot of the Home Defence Force, were transferred to Germany. The new conscripts were nicknamed Marie Louises, after Napoleon's young wife, who passed the new conscription laws in his absence. They were young and raw. Two-thirds were teenagers, and there was a severe lack of experienced officers and NCOs. In short, the countless irreplaceable veterans now lying beneath Russian soil. There was also a critical shortage of cavalry, a crisis mocked by British satirists. It would take Napoleon longer to replace the many thousands of horses and trained horsemen who'd perished in Russia. When Napoleon left Paris for Germany in mid-April, the French situation was precarious. Eugène had been forced back behind the river Elbe to the fortified city of Magdeburg. Dresden, the capital of Saxony, had fallen to the Prussians. Wow. The duchy Come of mecklenburg schwerin became the first German state to defect from Napoleon's Confederation of the Rhine. Russian Cossacks raided as far as Hamburg, inspiring local revolts against French occupying forces. Meanwhile, Austria stood on the sidelines, so far declining to back either side. 
Napoleon's miraculous feat of organisation meant he now had more than 200,000 troops in Germany. Mm. And the Emperor's personal magnetism was undimmed. The morale of his army was high. The Russians, on the other hand, lost their iconic commander, Field Marshal Kutuzov, to pneumonia on the 28th of April. His role was taken over by General Wittgenstein. Russian troops were exhausted and far from home. Their army weakened by the need to contain French garrisons across Poland and Germany. Prussia and Sweden had yet to fully mobilise their strength, and Allied forces barely mustered 100,000 men. They were now heavily outnumbered by Napoleon, and the French Emperor decided to strike quickly. He ordered Marshal Davout to Hamburg, with 35,000 men, to secure his northern flank. He would march against the Russian and Prussian forces converging on Leipzig to force a decisive battle. Victory would make Austria think twice about joining the Allies, allow him to rescue the 90,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, and re-establish his dominance over Europe. We need a full trail. Oh, wow. OK, 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 Napoleon, relax. Relax. <laughs> As Napoleon advanced on Leipzig, the Allies faced a predicament. To risk battle against Napoleon's larger army, or give up Germany without a fight. I don't think they're going to give up. Potentially devastating blow to Allied morale and any chance of winning Austria over to their cause. Allied headquarters made the bold decision to attack. Oh wow, okay. They knew most of Napoleon's army was made up of raw conscripts, that their own troops were better trained and had a great superiority in cavalry and artillery. Let me pause here, let me pause here. See, the problem with Napoleon's army is they're so young. They're conscripts. Conscripts are basically the low of the low. They knew, they never seen battle, they never seen anything. Now there's a high risk that they're gonna run away when they see the first draw of blood, when they see their first friend get shot or something like that. So you, maybe you have a big army, but it depends on the morale and you know the line of the soldiers' feelings and all this stuff. Because you can have a big army, but the, the big army is probably gonna crumble because they're young teenagers and they never really seen any war or blood or anything like that. So Napoleon is not really good standing with this but as Russia say we can do it we can do it we much more trained than that but let's see what happened I don't know what happens let's go uh oh the Allies agreed that as Napoleon crossed the Sala River they would hit his right flank before he could concentrate the full mass of his forces the two armies were on a collision course but Napoleon's shortage of cavalry meant he lacked information about Allied movements on the 1st of May, Marshal Bessier, commanding the cavalry in Murat's absence, was carrying out reconnaissance himself when he was hit by a cannonball aye, aye, aye. and killed instantly. Whew. Bessier was the second of Napoleon's marshals to be killed in action, and like Lance, an old comrade and trusted friend. Well, that happens in war. <laughs> the Allies sure. were able to surprise Napoleon falling on Marshal Ney's 3rd Corps near Lutzen. Ney's troops had to cling on in the face of a Russian and Prussian onslaught, while Napoleon rapidly redirected his other corps to fall on the enemy's flanks. At one stage, Napoleon had to personally help rally routing troops as they broke in the face of determined Prussian assaults. But on the whole, his young conscripts fought with courage. And despite That's hours good. of savage fighting, Wittgenstein could not exploit his early advantage. As French reinforcements arrived, the battle turned against him. Towards dusk, the Allies so were forced to death. break off the engagement. Unbelievable. Though they'd inflicted around 22,000 casualties, losing just half as many men. Wow. General von Scharnhorst, mortally wounded, was among them. 
Crucially, Napoleon's lack of cavalry meant he was unable to pursue the enemy, who retreated in good order. Expecting the Prussians to fall back on Berlin, Napoleon sent Marshal Ney in pursuit, oh, while wow. he continued east. Mm. Of course. But the Allied army stayed together, withdrawing to a defensive position at Bautzen, deliberately close to the Austrian border, hoping to entice Schwarzenberg to intervene, and daring Napoleon to violate Austrian neutrality. Neither happened. Instead, Napoleon ordered Ney to swing south, to fall on the Allies' northern flank, while he launched a frontal assault to pin them in place. Wow. The battle lasted two days, as French infantry struggled forward against the Prussian and Russian lines. But a misunderstanding over Ney's orders uh -oh. caused a delay that allowed of the course. Allies to narrowly escape Napoleon's trap. Once more, the Allies fought with great determination and inflicted many more losses than they suffered. There were more casualties during the pursuit, including the next day General Duroc, Grand Marshal of the Palace, responsible for Napoleon's personal arrangements, wow. and his closest surviving friend. Mm. Riding with Napoleon's staff, a freak cannon shot ricocheted off a tree and disemboweled him. Let me pause here. How fucking unlucky are you supposed to be from a tree and then hit you? Like, that's karma right there. You need to die because you kill probably many people, but it is what it is, I guess. But, you know, it's kind of it's kind of fucking ridiculous. But yeah, let's get into it. Let's go. His slow, painful death deeply upset Napoleon. I could imagine that. The Emperor continued his pursuit to Breslau, once again hindered by his lack of experienced cavalry, while Oudinot was sent north to take Berlin, but was held at Luckau by von Bülow's Prussian corps. Oh. On the 2nd of June, with both sides strained to breaking point, Neutral Austria proposed a ceasefire, which, to the surprise of many, Napoleon accepted. My eagles are again victorious, but I must start setting Napoleon to general column. Yeah, but... <sighs> the armistice of Plaswitz would last more than two months, a period of intense diplomacy and military mobilization by both sides. Napoleon wanted time to rebuild his cavalry, a shortage of which had allowed the Allies to escape twice. Wow. But he also wanted to keep Austria on side, which he feared might join the Allies with 200,000 troops, even though Emperor Francis I was now his father-in-law, uh -oh. since Napoleon's marriage to his daughter Ooh. Marie Louise in 1810. Austrian Foreign Minister Clemens von Metternich, who'd become one of 19th century Europe's most influential statesmen, now took centre stage. Metternich wanted peace and to see Austria restored as a great European power, which meant Napoleon contained, but not crushed, which would hand too much power to Russia. In June, he travelled to Dresden to ask Napoleon to make concessions while promising the Allies that if he did not, Austria would join them. But Napoleon dismissed Metternich's terms out of hand. He would not return the Illyrian provinces to Austria, agree to the repartition of Poland, or the breakup of the Confederation of the Rhine. All were out of the question. Napoleon famously threw his hat to the ground in fury. Peace and war then he must be mad. <laughs> in your majesty's hands, Metternich is said to have warned him. Today you can still make peace. Tomorrow it may be too late. But Napoleon preferred war to what he called a humiliating peace.
Expect the defeat whenever the Imperial attacks in person. Attack and defeat his lieutenants whenever you can. Yeah, that's true. You gotta go up the rank instead of the soldiers, of course. On the 12th of August, 1813, Austria joined the Sixth Coalition and declared war on France. Oh, wow. The Allies now had a numerical advantage of 3 to 2. And a new strategy, the Trachenberg Plan. The Trachenberg Recognising Napoleon's genius, the Allies would avoid battle with the Emperor and instead target his marshals, threaten his flanks oh, and wear down French forces. Wow. Until it was time to close in for the kill. That's genius. That is genius. Over the next few months, the coalition would also receive massive material support from Britain, including eight million pounds in Let me pause here. I like how my country is just in the middle of everything and it's just sitting there and doesn't do anything. Like that's my country when it's best, man. We just we just we just like to be ourselves. We don't really, you know, except from Sweden, of course, we had a big war with them, but they're brothers and sisters now, so it is what it is. But uh, yeah, just imagine that, man. Everything is going on down here, but uh, Denmark is just like, yeah, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Let's get it. And gold coin, two hundred cannon with transport, one hundred and twenty thousand firearms, eighteen million rounds of ammunition, twenty-three thousand barrels of gunpowder, thirty thousand swords and sabers. 150,000 uniforms, 175,000 pairs of boots, wow. 1.5 million pounds of beef, biscuit and flour, and 28,000 gallons rum of and rum brandy. and brandy. The total value of British aid to the coalition in 1813 was 11.3 million pounds. Today, worth around half a billion dollars. Whoa, that's crazy. Napoleon, meanwhile, had turned Dresden into a major supply depot and strengthened his cavalry arm, though it remained a pale shadow of its glorious past. Murat returned to lead it, his secret approach to the Allies having been rebuffed. But when news arrived of King Joseph's disastrous defeat to Wellington's Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army, at the Battle of Vittoria, Napoleon had to send Marshal Soult, one of his best commanders, to salvage the situation. Uh -huh. So now Spain is, uh, is like broad, like, hey, what's the 15th doing? of August, Napoleon left Dresden and advanced against what he considered the most urgent threat, the joint Prussian-Russian army of Silesia, commanded by General Gebhard von Blücher, <laughs> soon to win the nickname Marshal Forwards, <laughs> Marshal Forwards, for his aggressive leadership. Wow, okay. Sounds like a good guy to have in your front. But Blücher followed the new plan and retreated when he learned of Napoleon's advance. Napoleon then received news from Marshal Saint-Serre, holding Dresden with 20,000 men, that Schwarzenberg's gigantic army of Bohemia was approaching, and the city and its supplies were in danger. Napoleon left Marshal Macdonald to keep an eye on Blücher, and raced back to Dresden, sending Van Damme's 1st Corps to threaten Schwarzenberg's communications. By the time the Allied assault began, enough reinforcements had arrived to fight off the attack. Wow. The next day, despite being heavily outnumbered, Napoleon ordered a counterattack. Struggling through mud and heavy rain, Marshal Murat's advance, supported by Victor's second corps, broke the Allied left flank and took 13,000 prisoners. The Allies had suffered a disastrous defeat because they'd ignored their own rule. Don't take on Napoleon in battle. But news soon arrived that turned the situation on its head. Marshal Oudinot had resumed his advance on Berlin with 66,000 men. That's a lot of men. But in three days of heavy combat around Grossbiren, he was defeated by Bernadotte's oh, wow. army of the north. Some of the most savage fighting <laughs> was between the Serbian's Saxon allies and von Bülow's Prussians, two German states that for now remained on opposing sides. Three days later, 
at the Katzbach River, Blücher inflicted a crushing defeat on Marshal Macdonald, driving some French troops into the river itself. Macdonald lost 30,000 men, wow. three eagles and a hundred guns, for Blücher's 22,000 casualties. Three days after Napoleon's victory at Dresden, as Van Damme's corps pursued the Allies, it became trapped in wooded valleys around Kulm and was overrun. General Van Damme himself was dragged from his horse by Cossacks, as he and 10,000 of his men were made prisoner. What? That's crazy. Napoleon sent Ney to take over from Oudinot, who engaged Bülow's Prussian corps at Denewitz. The Prussians fighting to save Berlin held their own, until Russian and Swedish reinforcements arrived to turn the battle decisively in the Allies' favour. But that never happened, Ney's right? retreat became oh. a rout with the loss of another 22,000 wow. men. Wow. Napoleon's brilliant victory at Dresden had been completely overturned in just 10 days. The Allied plan was working. Napoleon became increasingly frustrated as Allied armies withdrew wherever he advanced and advanced wherever he was not. Ah! His teenage conscripts were exhausted by constant marching. Of course. And famished as Saxony had been stripped bare of supplies. Thousands fell sick. Thousands more deserted. Russian and Prussian light troops were now operating behind Napoleon's army, harassing his communications with France. Many of Napoleon's marshals wow. advised him to pull Let me back. pause here. This, this is a genius strategy to, you know, run out the army. Like, they have to go from A to B all the time, and then you run them out. And you still have soldiers, but you still do the thing. You still avenge where he doesn't advance. That's the most smartest thing ever, man. It's so logical, but people, they don't get it. Like, you know, they have too much honor, respect, and this is just how you wear the Napoleon guy down, man. That's crazy. Let's go. To the River Rhine. But Napoleon wasn't giving up Germany without a fight. Of course not. There will invariably be a great battle at Lisbsk, Napoleon Marshal Ney. Wow, okay. By October 1813, Napoleon faced a third of a million Allied troops in Germany, converging on him from three directions. 900 miles away, Field Marshal Wellington was crossing the Bidassoa River into France. The first enemy army on French soil in nearly 20 years. Wow. That's crazy. While the Kingdom of Bavaria, a French ally since the days of Austerlitz, had secretly agreed to switch sides. Uh oh And would declare war on France wow. on the 14th of October. Look at that. Napoleon planned to defend the line of the River Elbe. But the arrival of General Bennigsen's reserve Russian army freed up Blücher, who suddenly marched to join forces with Bernadotte mm. and forced his way across the Elbe at Wartenberg. Wow. Napoleon went north with 150,000 men, seeking the decisive battle that would change his fortunes. But once more, Blücher narrowly escaped him. Then came news from Murat, who'd been left with 67,000 men to cover Schwarzenberg. The enemy had bypassed Dresden and was heading for Leipzig. If the city fell, Napoleon would be cut off from France. Once more, he was advised to fall back to the Rhine. But instead, Napoleon ordered all his forces to concentrate at Leipzig. He would risk everything in one great battle to decide the fate of his empire and the fate of Europe. Wow. That is crazy, actually, man. Let me pause here. That was an amazing video. I just have to see Napoleon is a crazy, crazy guy. Like, he's a really smart guy in war and everything with the strategic points, the, the chess games. Everything when he plays is actually very nice. Like, he killed a lot of soldiers and he won a lot of wars because people, they basically stupid. 
with the strategies and everything. And Napoleon was actually very smarter than that. And that's just amazing. That's a guy not to admire because there was many people who died, but so did the Russians. But it is what it is. No people is deserve to die like that. But I just want to say the aspect of it, the game of it, the chess game of it, the strategy. It's just beautiful to see that Napoleon actually did these things like he never gave up. He got defeated, but then he come back. And in life, you can use that term as when you get defeated, come back because there's another day to fight. Always retreat so you're sure there's another day to fight. That is just beautiful to see, man. Really beautiful to hear, too. Napoleon was a wow. He was a military guy, a totally military guy. I actually didn't know he was this smart. I actually didn't know. I heard a little bit about him, like in history, in, in the ground school, but... I really didn't hear all of this, like Russia came back and then, you know, Napoleon came back. I only heard like the crossing of the uh, the lake or whatever that was where he where he lost a lot of men or whatever. But uh, it's kind of crazy to see, man. But thank you so much for that comment request. I really do appreciate it. Guys and girls, if you really want to support this or you like this video right here, please hit the like button down below. And if we almost at a thousand subscribers, so it would be massively appreciated if you would subscribe and hit that notification bell so you get updated by the newest video videos on my channel um but guys and girls i'm gonna move on into the next one this was a beautiful video i have to say man so yeah peace